All right. Well, thank you folks for coming. And like I said, thanks for being on time. I'm Carolyn Merrick here at the center. And today we have with us Anisha Singh. Anisha is a PhD physics student at Stanford University. Um, and oops, let me just let this person in. Uh, she's here to tell us about the fascinating yet little known story about the frequency spectrum and how it's used by satellites, cellular communication companies, TV and radio and uh, researchers, and some of the controversies and solutions that uh, have emerged over the past century with this technology. So Anisha, thanks for joining us and uh, please elucidate us on this fascinating topic. Right, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Carolyn. I will just start sharing my screen. Um, so like Carolyn mentioned, I'm a PhD student at uh, Stanford. So I'm calling you right now from Palo Alto, California. Um, and I study physics, particularly material physics, but today I'll be talking to you about a subject um, I'm not as much of an expert about, but that I found really fascinating. And I'm hoping by the end of today's presentation, I can convince to you as well as really uh, interesting problem that we have. Um, and so what I've titled it here on this slide is what I'm calling America's most competitive real estate market. And as Carolyn already mentioned, what I'm talking about is our frequency spectrum, our airwaves. Um, so just how competitive are we talking about? So uh, in the most recent auction that the US government held to sell off licenses uh, for different companies and investors uh, to use our airways, this took place uh, in last September, 2020. Uh, this netted over $4 billion for those licenses. Um, and this is, uh, when I first learned about this, this is pretty uh, crazy to wrap your head around for a couple of reasons. First off, that's a lot of money. Um, and so just realizing how coveted access to our airways is and how much, uh, hence, uh, different companies are willing to spend for that access. Um, but even just taking a step back, being just the concept that the very airspace around us is something that uh, you can own and that the US government gives licenses for um, is not uh, something that you can take pause, think about. Um, so what I wanna spend some time uh, going through in this presentation is just really what that system is, um, how we got to this system in the US and what the implications of that system uh, have been uh, in the past and also what they might be in the future. Um, so before going any further, I just wanna be uh, really explicit about what these people are paying billions of dollars for. So what exactly is an airwave? So I'll give a bit of a technical uh, um, description first. So what an airwave is, is just a slice of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. So let's break that down. So in the middle here is probably a word you've seen before, radiation. So uh, radiation, when scientists use that word, it's just a general term uh, to refer to the transmission of energy. In this case, uh, energy transmitted via a wave. Um, electromagnetic is just a fancy word to mean that that wave carries both an electrical field and a magnetic field. And then spectrum in this case is referring to a range of different types of waves waves that are moving or oscillating at a faster rate, so they're at higher frequencies, or waves that are oscillating at a lower rate or slower rate, so at lower frequencies. So what this really is, what scientists are talking about is light. An airwave is just light at a very specific frequency or at a narrow uh, range of frequencies, which we call a band. Um, so why might one be interested in spending many, many billions of dollars to get access to uh, our airwaves. And it's because we can use light, the light and airwaves to communicate and send information. All right, so uh, just a little uh, about how we are able to do this. Um, so let's say that you own an airwave and that means you can transmit a signal at a just uh, a fixed uh, frequency. Um, however, you may have a signal uh, that you want to transmit that probably is at a different frequency or the mix of other, has a lot of other information in it. So uh, let's take this example on the top, which is just a pretty simple signal. If you actually, if this was an audio signal and you actually were to listen to it, it would just be a single pitch that was very flat um, at uh, the same volume. But let's say you want to transmit that uh, to your friends. All right. 
So uh, how would you uh, use light then to transmit that signal? And there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. Um, two uh, probably common examples that you have interacted with are what we call amplitude modulation or AM and frequency modulation or FM. So in this case, you have the frequency that you're able to transmit at, so your carrier frequency, and you're modulating some aspect of that signal in order to encode your, the signal that you want to transmit or your message, right? So here you can see in the amplitude modulation example, you're making your transmitted signal stronger and weaker at a rate that matches your original signal. So then the radio receiver in your house or in your car uh, can feeds in the combination of this carrier frequency, but also the slower frequency envelope um, and is able to demodulate or basically decode that signal from the carrier frequency. And then you can listen to your favorite music. Um, so you can see though, and you probably something you might've experienced is that if say two radio stations are transmitting at the same carrier frequency or very close to uh, the same uh, frequencies, those signals will interfere. Um, so it's important that uh, different users have distinct carrier frequencies that they are able to use. And uh, you might be able to see the reason why there is a need for distinct allocation of different frequency bands. Um, and then when we're talking about the users of our uh, communication spectrum, like uh, Karen alluded to, there are a lot of people who want to use this space. So obviously there's good old radio that we just talked about, but there's all kinds of people who are using our radio spectrum. Um, so at the lower frequency bands, um, there is a lot of uh, usage of maritime navigation. Um, there's GPS satellites, wireless communication and Wi-Fi, uh, broadcast television, and also a lot of research for space and astronomy research different satellites that are using the radio communication, radio spectrum to communicate. Um, and all these folks, and you can see that the, the communication range of our of the full electromagnetic spectrum is only a small part of uh, all the light that we actually uh, that we interact with. So uh, radio frequencies are really just the lowest frequencies of the full electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and there's a reason for this. Uh, light at very low wavelengths can travel for very long distances without dissipating. This is ideal for communication. Um, uh, higher uh, frequency um, uh, 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 I just was I don't, you guys probably can't see my mind. I don't think you can see my cursor right now when I'm pointing out. <laughs> Actually, we can it's circling around. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, higher frequency uh, light um, has much more energy, but it dissipates over very short distances. So it wouldn't be ideal to use to communicate. And then, so that's things like gamma rays and X-rays. Also, because they are such high energy, they also are very harmful. So they wouldn't be ideal to use <laughs> for those kinds of applications. And in the middle here, you have visible light. Um, so uh, you might be wondering why I'm a scientist and why that I find this uh, as an interesting problem. And this is because I think frequency allocation is a really interesting problem in science policy, sitting at the intersection of science and technology and also um, at public policy. So on uh, the science and technology side, the decisions we make about who gets access to which frequency bands has a lot of implications for the development of new technologies and about which technologies we promote and become uh, commonplace in, in, um, in America. So uh, we'll see a lot of examples in the later part of this presentation where certain decisions that were made by the US government um, about uh, the regulation of the frequency bands had a lot of implications for the development of uh, broadcast television on FM radio and a few other examples. But there's also a lot of implications uh, that are interesting to consider here on just the public access side. Um, so there's still a lot of debate over what role government should have in regulating our airwaves. Um, some people say that uh, having this authoritative body who, who decides who has access to transmit and receive information 
um, may not be in the best interest of that, uh, that body is subject to political pressures or could be lobbied and et cetera. So there's some implications here about free speech. Um, and also just going back to my original point, um, it is a little bit strange to think about. Uh, there maybe is a question of fairness here as for uh, about the ownership of a public good, about the air all the airspace all around us. Does it does it seem fair for a private company to profit over the or exclusive access to a public good? Um, and so these are all questions that the U.S. government, that companies and investors, scientists, that are all still debating. So. Um, as you'll see towards the end of the presentation, there are no really good answers to all these questions. That's what makes it, I think, a really fascinating problem to study. All right. So, so far I've, studied, I've talked a little about the technology side of what's been happening uh, on, in our frequency space, but I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and go into a bit of the history of where our frequency allocation system came from in the US. So, the history of frequency regulation in the US starts from a seemingly unrelated event. And so what the picture on this slide is, it is an artist's rendition of the uh, rescue from the RMS Titanic. And so why is this related, you might ask. So Titanic sunk in April of 1912. And uh, right a few hours before it uh, uh, went down completely, a radio operator uh, transmitted a distress signal um, that was heard throughout the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this was a really, the radio telegraph was a very novel, uh, 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 this was a novel use of technology at the time. It wasn't standard for, uh, for ships to be using these kinds of distress signals. Um, but this was actually very helpful. Um, a lot of ships nearby, particularly the RMS Carpathia, heard the distress signal that was sent from the Titanic and was able to come to the site of the, of the Titanic disaster and save several hundred of Titanic survivors. Um, so radio saved the day. Um, however, investigations very soon after the Titanic sinking quickly revealed that there were several ships much closer to the Titanic than the Carpathia was that never heard the distress signal. And at the time, this actually wasn't very surprising because the world of radio was just basically a lawless land. Um, there really was no protocol for prioritizing emergency traffic um, over our airwaves or to observe radio silences in the event of an emergency disaster. Um, or there was, any, there was no standardization of which frequency bands that the Titanic should have been transmitting the distress signal at or which frequency bands that uh, other ships should have been monitoring uh, for distress signals. So the Titanic disaster um, really influenced, influenced U.S. politicians at the time. So President Taft signed the Radio Act of 1912, um, which formally designated that uh, folks would have to obtain a license from the U.S. government to uh, transmit at a certain frequency. So this established the sort of the regulation process in the United States. This was followed up by the Radio Act of 1934, which formally established the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC which you may have heard in the news recently for uh, uh, several other things, um, but they are the government agency in charge of uh, assigning frequency bands for any non-governmental users or any private usage. So uh, the example of the Titanic gives sort of one perspective of why this type of regulation uh, can be useful and is necessary. Um, we, in a sense, we may need the sort of authoritative power to oversee how the frequency space is used and to delegate that access so we can have efficient um, and reliable uh, communication of information, especially information that's really important in a disaster scenario. So the government involvement can make sense in that case. But since its inception, how the Federal Communications Commission has uh, uh, presided over our airwaves has been fraught with a bit of controversy. So I'll go through a couple examples of some interesting stories in the next slide about uh, some of the regulation the FCC uh, has uh, uh, sort of promulgated over the last century um, that has had maybe some unintended consequences. So uh, one of the really interesting examples um, comes from broadcast television. 
So for the majority of the 20th century, um, which is uh, crazy to think about today because we have so many avenues for information uh, in 2021, but uh, for the majority of the 20th century, broadcast television really dominated just by three stations, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And uh, on this slide, you can see the pictures of their logos from the 1950s. Um, and uh, they formed a very powerful lobbying group or part of a very powerful lobbying group known as the National Association of Broadcasters. Um, and they were very fierce and wanted to keep their share of the market share um, uh, in terms of supplying uh, uh, television or information to Americans. So at the time, uh, in the 1950s, a new technology was being introduced known as CATV or more commonly as cable TV. Um, and this did not technically fall under the jurisdiction of the Federal Communications Commission because cable TV transmits their information over cables, not over our airspace. Um, so uh, technically they would not be involved with the frequency allocation procedures. However, broadcast television of these companies were felt very threatened by the emergence of cable TV and its expansion into new communities. Um, so they lobbied hard with the FCC to actually get the FCC to preemptively uh, regulate and stall the advancement of cable TV into a lot of new uh, American communities. And they argue that this was necessary because um, if uh, these companies lost their share of the market, sh uh, their share of the market, um, they may not be profitable and they may not be able to uh, provide their services anymore. And they argued that for a lot of Americans, uh, broadcast television was really the only reliable news source that these Americans were getting. Um, but sort of ironically at the time, between these three news suppliers, they only broadcast about 15 minutes of news per day. Um, and this seems just in wild contrast to now where we have 24 hours, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week news cycles. Um, so it's not really clear if what the broadcast television communities were doing was actually protecting the American consumer. Um, they were protecting their monopoly. Um, later on into the 60s and 70s, cable TV would become deregulated and we just get an explosion of different channels and uh, networks being offered to, um, uh, to the American consumer. But you can see as an example of how uh, the FCC's ability to be influenced by external powers uh, can uh, persist legislation or regulation that really is harmful for American consumers and protects um, uh, corporations that have uh, uh, that have monopolies. Um, another really interesting example comes from the advent of FM radio. So on this slide here is a picture of Edwin Armstrong uh, Howard, who invented the FM radio in 1933. Um, and so when he invented this technology, um, it really was novel for the time because as you probably have heard, FM radio has much superior audio quality to AM radio. Um, and so he went to the FCC to get uh, uh, frequency bands assignments for FM radio stations. Um, and these were assigned in the, between the 40 and 50 megahertz range. So, uh, quite different from maybe the 88 to 108 megahertz that you might be more familiar with for FM radio that we use today. And there's a little bit of history here about what has a bit of a story here that what happened. So again, the National Association of Broadcasters, uh, they saw that this band between 40 and 50 megahertz got assigned to FM radio. But the thing was, they also really wanted that band space. Um, so they lobbied again, the FCC, uh, for access to their bands, um, and they won um, that fight. So FM radio was reassigned to 88 to 108 megahertz. However, what this meant is all the existing technology that had been developed for FM radio, all the transmitters, all the receivers were now obsolete. Um, a lot of these devices have very frequency dependent components. Um, so once you change the frequency bands you're working in, the device doesn't work. Um, so uh, it would take several more decades before uh, uh, new technology was developed that FM radio would become uh, available to American consumers. So uh, 
ephemerae, like I said, was invented in the 1930s, but it wasn't until the 1960s that American consumers actually had more widespread access to it, which is really a shame because you had a technology that was shown to be uh, a technological improvement over existing technology at the time, which was AM radio, but it took three decades for anyone to get it. Um, and uh, so there is, in retrospect, people are very uh, 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 critical of the FCC's actions at the time. Um, so you might be thinking, Anisha, that's two examples from the 1950s. Why should I care about this now? And that's a valid point. Um, and the thing is, is although we have many new technologies that we are considering today, like cellular phones, Wi-Fi, the players are different, um, but a lot of the problems still remain. Um, so a lot has changed though regulation-wise since the 1950s to now 2021. So going back to that original slide that I showed in the very beginning, um, some of the biggest change is that we no longer, the FCC doesn't just hand out licenses to people who apply to them, you have to pay for them. Um, so the FCC runs these auctions. Um, so uh, this is a bit of a different approach. Uh, now you have a bit more of a, a, a kind of a pay to play access of our, uh, of our airwaves. Um, and many say this is a step in the right direction. Um, for one thing, uh, there's, a, there's a good argument to be made that for the companies that are willing to spend the most to access a frequency airwave, then they probably are the most incentivized to then turn that airwave into a competitive and marketable product. Um, so that's that's one argument. Also, um, it sort of, uh, it, uh, you can argue that it depoliticizes the process, right? So now that just the folks who pay the most get the access, you they aren't subject now to the, the political pressuring of uh, the FCC. Um, so this is seen as a step in the right direction by many, um, but there's still a ways to go. Um, we can see this now. So with the current fight in our airways right now is this fight for 5G. So a lot of cellular communication companies need more frequency bandwidths for their 5G technologies. Um, I can explain a little bit more of that maybe at the end if folks are interested. Um, so the FCC has this new problem about how do we free up, um, because like I mentioned, the, the radio spectrum is very congested. There are a lot of users. So how do we uh, free up space in the airwaves for new technologies and then once we do that, how do we uh, how do we best divide and distribute that space uh, to wireless companies then who want to uh, develop 5G technologies? Um, and so I will I will leave things there for now, um, just with uh, a few sort of outstanding questions that we may want to discuss, or if folks had questions about anything I discussed so far, either about the history, um, about new te new technologies like 5G. Um, but like I said, this is still this is a very complex issue uh, that economists and scientists have been debating for a long time about just fundamentally what the government should be doing in uh, uh, in sort of regulating our airwaves and if a better system exists um, and how we can design this system to best serve the American public, who really is the ultimate uh, owner of this of this uh, of this good. Um, and also to, and also the American as a consumer, as a consumer of these technologies. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there for right now. And thank you for your attention. These are very interesting questions. I'm going to unmute people. So let me do that. Okay, so if you have a question, you can either write it in the chat or a discussion, anything, um, or you can unmute yourselves at this point. I just like to say that um, I I never knew what AM and FM stood for. So, oh yeah, <laughs> right? that was and just seeing the modulation and how that worked, um, that was quite the education for me. I I am curious though, Anisha, about other countries and how they do things. That is super, that's a really fascinating point. So, I mean, a lot of countries are, are trying to contend with this right now about how to modernize their cellular communications, particularly about 5G technologies. And it is very different. A lot of countries like China, 
And other examples, uh, all this infrastructure is completely government owned. So there isn't any kind of um, back and forth between private companies and the government. Um, and some might say it's a better system, maybe that's more efficient, um, but there are also other, other places in the world where it's completely private. Um, the frequency space works like uh, any kind of other private market, like an actual real estate market. There are people who own it, they privately sell it, that's just how it works. And that also seems to work quite efficiently. Um, the US has kind of landed somewhere in the middle um, and kind of has legacies of kind of both of these sorts of systems of having government involvement um, and uh, uh, government involvement, but also sort of more of a free private market. Um, and I, well, I guess we'll kind of see which, which system ends up being the best in the end. Right, right. Well, that's interesting to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed someone unmuted themselves and we also have a question in the chat. Sure, let me just find the chat. I can read it to you as well. Oh, okay. So <laughs> thanks for the question, Carlton. So Carlton asks, what do you know about the new communication satellite system that Musk is currently developing? Personally, I do not know much about uh, what Elon Musk is up to. Um, so uh, I don't think, at least on the uh, acquisition side, I don't think he has formally, uh, 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 what's called, gone to the FCC to obtain any licensing for, uh, for usage that would have to, uh, I mean, you can build a communication satellite, but you need to get an authorization from the US government to transmit a certain frequency. I don't think he's gone through this procedure yet, um, but that's basically all I know. <laughs> Oh, that's good enough. Thank you. Um, Bruce or News Review? Now, yeah. Yeah, the FCC uh, regulates the frequency distribution in this country, but what, I mean, I mean, those radio waves go around to other countries. This is uh, true. Around the world. Who regulates those? No, that's an excellent question. So uh, this is a good point that's brought up. So an airwave obviously has a geographic constraint. These, uh, uh, um, these things don't go on forever, but uh, these airwaves transmitted over the US obviously go beyond the US. So there is a different board of control for specifically um, uh, in maritime and our oceans uh, between countries. Um, so I was specifically focusing on basically uh, sort of American corporations or uh, in the US but you're right, there are other bodies uh, that coordinate these efforts or coordinate the air traffic. Um, sorry, that's probably the wrong word to use. The air wave traffic, um, uh, particularly in our oceans uh, and between countries. Hmm. Uh, could I make a comment? Sure. Uh, there is the International Union of Radio People and they get together roughly once every four or five years to coordinate all this throughout the world. Uh, the US is just one member of that, of course, and all the rest of them. Now that, as you point out, is mostly for the low frequencies. The stuff you're talking about is a very limited portion of the spectrum. Uh, right. From about 10 gigahertz to 500 megahertz, roughly speaking. Uh, because that's the limit. Uh, things don't work well otherwise. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a good point. Yeah, a lot of things that we're using for uh, that end up being relevant for kind of this uh, long wave transmission or uh, transmission over long distances, these really low frequency uh, communications. The things that cell 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 like Wi-Fi communication and cell companies are using are in two gigahertz range and upwards. And as well as uh, <laughs> the satellites that are being put up, you can't imagine he's spending billions of dollars just putting up satellites, hoping he's going to get spectrum. Yeah, I, I think they're probably, um, I don't know how far along they are in this process. Um, as far as I've heard in the news, I, I mean, he, I don't know, they're probably, there probably is something in the works. Um, yeah, they're at the first stage of testing at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. Full up system is due in about three years. I see. Thanks for your information. Yeah. 
And it's only one of three systems like that, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are lots of things going up like that. There yeah. are satellite bands. There are specific bands set up for satellites. Mm -hmm. I am curious about 5G, Anisha. Oh, I mean, uh, I think the reason that it ends up being, uh, at least has been very, I don't wanna use the word controversial, but like uh, has been a, uh, a thing, a lot of people who I guess work in the frequency space have been thinking a lot about, um, is, it's a couple of things in combination. Um, so, this is kind of paralleling just with the advent of cell cellular phones. Um, uh, this new sort of auction model that the FCC has been using. Um, and so this is carried over. We're still using this to try to facilitate the transition to 5G technologies. But there's still everything a good, the government doesn't have a good way of doing this yet of how do you get um, uh, a lot of what they call legacy technology, technologies that don't get a lot of traffic that are want to hang on to their frequency bands because they're so profitable. They know they can hang on to them because they got a lot of money for it. There's actually a lot of interesting stories um, about uh, folks who got into the frequency space purely for investment reasons. Um, they had an inkling that they bought up these random radio stations with the idea that someone's going to want this down the road and now are netting, uh, I mean, uh, just really prolific profits off these sort of investments. So it's sort of the political, like kind of the kind of political economic issue here of uh, you, you have these cellular companies who want to pay top dollar uh, to roll out their technologies. Um, but you also have, you have to incentivize people to give up that license um, at a price that makes sense. It's also a little more political because a lot of the people who now own space in this spec and are in the, in this in the US frequency spectrum uh, are foreign companies uh, and people don't like the idea of uh, foreign companies or foreign investors uh, netting a lot of money off of these transactions. Before, you know, a lot of the money that uh, was generated from these auctions, it went into the Federal Reserve. So it came, it was seen as going back to Americans. Um, and that kind of the argument that you can sell this public good because the money is coming back to US citizens in a way. Um, so people are kind of unhappy with that idea as well. And then 5G itself, um, uh, it is pushing into higher and higher uh, frequency bands. Um, I mean, basically you can think of as something is wiggling at a faster rate, kind of thinking back to that picture of AM and FM, this is not how it works, but just thinking about <laughs> how we, uh, how basically we modulate a wave to encode information. If something is wiggling at a faster rate, you can probably convince yourself that you can actually put more information into that wave. And that's kind of the idea of 5G, um, is that at these higher frequencies, you can transmit more information. Um, mm. But you still need a good mix of these lower frequencies for this long range for reliable communication. So 5G is trying to kind of bridge this traditional uh, lower frequencies that we use for communication, for wireless communication with uh, higher frequency bands that haven't really been used for this purpose before, um, but to facilitate faster uh, transmission information. Hmm. Fascinating. Well, thank you for doing this uh, presentation. It's just uh, fascinating, is that there, there are several other aspects uh, that occur to me. And uh, they, they are in terms of, uh, when do we have the public versus private interests? You know, our, our electric utilities are, are owned by private companies, but generally there's very strong oversight. So uh, they don't get too much monopoly power. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think the danger we're facing the, the, in all of this, we, we're kind of at a tipping point where that there are certain organizations that have gotten such a monopoly, they've gotten control of airwaves. It goes over the internet as well. And uh, they have so much power. And, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, that all of a sudden they, they are stepping on free speech. They're saying, uh, uh, you know, what organizations can be on, uh, and Amazon has even shut down some things. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, that's why we're at a very dangerous tipping point, uh, uh, almost, uh, you know, wh where the railroads became uh, uh, publicly oversight, where our oil companies had 
uh, were broken up and have public oversight because we had uh, we had certain people that had such hubris that they think they can tell uh, you know all of us uh, what information we have access to. Uh, some of these folks uh, look at our cable companies uh, and and uh, you know airwave company like AT and T. Uh, they dictate to us that we must uh, we must buy certain. Uh, cable channels and certain uh, television channels in bundles. We can't unbundle them and buy just what we want. And so I think, I think we're really getting into a, a point of almost going back to the early uh, 20th century where the oil companies and the railroad companies had so much power that the government finally had to step in, Teddy Roosevelt and others, and say, look, we're gonna break you up. You, you, are, you are just dictating too much to the American consumer. You're, you're controlling prices too much. Uh, you're dictating this. And, and I think we're at that kind of tipping point now. And, and it's almost, I think, uh, almost to the point where people are becoming enraged about uh, we're being told what we can listen to, uh, what, we, what information we can have access to, uh, what channels we have to listen to. Uh, and so have you thought about that at all as an overlay to this? You know, how do you control this? Uh, you give people access to airways, private companies, and many of them, quite frankly, are just abusing it. Mm -hmm. No, you bring up really a lot of fascinating points. Obviously, what's happening in the frequency spectrum has a lot of analogies to a lot of uh, American resources, a lot of different industries, like you mentioned, um, with um, our electric infrastructure as well. So um, this is, uh, like you said, this is kind of like a story that we've seen uh, quite a bit in America of uh, different, uh, we have a history of big monopolies in this country. Um, and how the government has intervened in some cases um, and other cases have not. Um, this, the frequency space kind of is a, was a weird mix um, because it's almost always been regulated at least when it really, um, so like I said, it started in 1912. So uh, radio communication was just pretty fledgling at this point. Um, I don't think there was really good and even a good understanding about what even now in the 21st century we've been using this airspace for. Um, and so the two have always been kind of deeply tied. Um, and it is kind of interesting uh, that in some cases, government regulation, at least in our frequency spectrum, kind of had the opposite effect. Um, you know, they, there were a lot of uh, regulation that the FCC put forth throughout the 20th century. They had these things like different kinds of fairness doctrines um, that were, you know, put out in good faith that, uh, you know, because our airways are a limited resource. Uh, they basically told radio companies that uh, you had to give equal um, airtime basically to um, uh, contradictory viewpoints basically, um, which sounds like a good idea, but in practice, uh, they didn't really follow it up with any kind of, uh, kind of uh, any kind of detail of how this should be done. So that doesn't really happen in practice. Um, so, uh, it, it, it definitely, there's, there's pressures from both sides, right? Like you can see definitely that, that government oversight can definitely be a solution when you have these big monopolies. Um, and to, uh, I mean, it should be the solution to uh, uh, take care of uh, the American consumer. Uh, that should be at the best interest of the American consumer. Um, but government, influ government regulation can also be influenced um, by different corporations uh, in a way that uh, is not helpful. So it, it's challenging. It definitely is challenging. Um, and like I said, like I, uh, during the day, I'm just a scientist, so I don't, <laughs> but I like thinking about these things. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure what the right, what the right solution is at this point. Um, but it definitely, uh, I think all I'm saying is that smart people should definitely be thinking about this because I think it's only going to, like you said, it's only going to become a bigger issue. A lot of spokes on this wheel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make another comment as long as I get You pointed out that in the 1960-ish time frame, there were basically three companies that owned the television channels. And so you were told what you could watch that way. And the What's happened is technology has said, okay, you don't have to watch these three channels anymore. These are 14,000 different choices. In a sense, we've gone the other way. We have too many choices. Yeah, it, it definitely is. It's strange to think about now um, 
just that statistic about they're just being 15 minutes of news per day between these three networks is just, you know, not only I mean, just from TV, but we have so many avenues to get information these days. Um, so, I mean, maybe the argument that the government had that, you know, the airways are so limited that, you know, we have to control what's being transmitted so the American consumer gets the best product. Maybe it's going to make it not really a lot of, because we have some different avenues for communication now and for information dispersal, maybe that control makes less sense. I don't know. But yeah, it's definitely, it's, 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 it's always startling. I mean, I, I, I was not around in during that time period, but it's always, it's always strange to think about how, how much has changed um, with these technologies during the last 50 years. Yeah, it was three channels in my house, three, six, and 10, yeah. you know, and then UHF came, woohoo. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm sure a lot of you all can relate to that. And uh, it was a lot more um, oh yeah, this is how it is because there was a lot of the same information, I think, um, in the news, um, the programs, you know, it was different eras have different, um, what's the word to them? I don't even know, not a genre to them, but um, different values were represented at that time than maybe now there's a lot more out there. So it's, I don't know the answer either, you know, but you sure made me think a lot about a lot of things on this. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, any questions or comments? This is a fascinating discussion to me. Seems to me somebody has to regulate who gets what frequencies, otherwise they'll be transmitting on top of each other. So, um, well, and, and another example is the internet the, uh, addresses uh, some, there is a, somebody who, who assigns addresses to various uh, websites, depending on, uh, I don't know what it depends on, you know, they have to re request it. And uh, I don't know who makes money out of it. Somebody must make money out of it, but... <laughs> Regulations required, even though, you know, people don't like it. <laughs> this reminds me of the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think when we divide the airways up and we're essentially selling access to those airways, is that it's great responsibility. And I think what I would advocate is that our government needs to expand some of the things that they control. For example, on the internet, the, the server farms that are absolutely huge, that are run by uh, Apple, that are run by uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, and, and Amazon, that, that they are essentially controlling access to the internet. Is that if you can't get on one of those server farms, you know, that's limiting competition. And I think that becomes a really serious issue where the government needs to step in and said, those server farms are quite frankly, they're, they're a form of, 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 of broadcasting because you can't get on the internet if you can't get on one of those server farms. Mm -hmm. You know, it becomes dysfunctional. So I think that needs to be, uh, that needs to be uh, expanded, that definition, so that we don't limit competition. I think the other thing that occurs to me is that we have a balance between public oversight and the great responsibility uh, when we uh, relinquish that oversight to private companies that they don't act like czars and monopolies, and they don't uh, they don't act as uh, they don't act as uh, censors. They don't they don't decide they don't limit competition. They decide uh, who can and cannot compete and how they can compete. I think that becomes very dangerous, and where the government needs to step in, like they did with the the electric utilities and the oil companies and the gas companies, and say no no no, you may not do that. You know you you are limiting competition. And if you're establishing, you know, server farms in such a way that you're limiting competition because you do because you pick and choose who can have access to that, that becomes very dangerous for uh, for uh, you know our free society that we have. Right. No, thank you so much for your perspectives. I mean, if I was to make a prediction, you know, we see. Uh, I mean, what happened with Facebook recently, um, in, within the U.S. government. I would, I would say there, I, I think there may be more of that in the near future with these big companies that you're, you're, you're uh, bringing up. Um, because I mean, it, it is, it, we are working in a completely new technology space, but 
the the, the legislation is to catch up with new technologies, basically. Um, I mean, I think this is why the government is always struggling in this space because they're always outpaced. Scientists and technologies and engineers always developing new things and don't realize how this space is going to be used. And then we understand how this space is going to be used and the regulation has to catch up basically. Um, so I think if I had to make, I think that's gonna maybe start happening in the next few years, maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna hold you to that prediction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, that's, again, thinking about things I don't usually think about, um, but it sounds like a lot of folks on this Zoom have thought deeply about this and know a lot about the things you're sharing about. So that's well, kind one of quick, fun. quick additional point I'll make is that I, I really celebrate uh, Elon Musk and what he's, uh, what he's done with SpaceX. When you, when you think about it, you know, NASA had a total monopoly on anything we put into space. And all of a sudden, uh, Elon Musk came along and he said, hey, wait a minute now. Uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have to have uh, rockets that are once and done. You know, they cost uh, millions and millions of dollars. We send them into space and then they burn up. Is that we can have reusable rockets and we can, and, and we can, uh, we can launch satellites with reusable rockets and we can do that at a fraction of the price. And I think, uh, you, you know, that's the way that, that, that uh, America to me should operate is that when an entrepreneur comes along with something that's so, so dramatically better uh, that he can do it better than the government can. And, and I applaud the government stepping aside and said, hey, go for it. If you, if you can do it and he is doing it at a dr dramatically lower cost, I think that's, uh, you know, I think uh, I celebrate his entrepreneurship and also what he's doing with the electric car market. I don't think the electric, uh, electric car market would be anywhere near what it is now as advanced as far without Elon Musk and what he's done with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Tesla. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, it's a, it's a good perspective. Um, I think a lot of people will argue the testament of the American economy uh, is in large part to uh, how we let private companies operate. And, um, you know, I brought the example that, you know, there are other countries in this world where this system is completely government owned from top to bottom. Um, and in a lot of ways, I mean, a lot of economists much smarter than I am will argue that uh, a lot of uh, America's development, particularly in the technology sector, has been in large part due to the fact that we have a sort of uh, this disconnect between uh, having these private organizations and entrepreneurs who are able to uh, develop uh, and work independently. Um, and so that definitely is a, that is a, that is a strong point. Um, I mean, everything to an extent, right? And, you know, we go down that line again, and when do we get to a point where these private companies have too much power? But uh, it definitely is, uh, it definitely is a good point. Anyone else? Questions, thoughts, comments? Speak now. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I am evidently am the least informed person <laughs> in this group. And I think maybe a lot of the people who are participating should get together and talk with each other and put out some things to help those of us who would like to think about this more, you know, have some shape to this so that scientists can come back and talk to the people like me who might be interested, but we're just running behind all the time. Every time we get on a Zoom program, there's 13 reasons why somebody else wasn't able to tune in. You know, there's just lots of stuff going on. And also, I wonder, with this, um, you know, this was a PowerPoint presentation that you had, is that right? Could that be made available, like, uh, for those of us that are on? I mean, just like a PDF. Yeah, I can share it with Carolyn. And if yeah, Carolyn, you know, so we could say, okay, here's a concept which I don't understand. You know? mm. Even better, even better than that. This is being recorded, and we'll put it on our YouTube website, so the PowerPoint will be there along with Anisha and this yeah. wonderful discussion. Right. So, um, yeah, if you, um, I mean, we can do both. It sounds like Anisha will also share the PowerPoint with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. In other words, and I'm. Being pretty old, I'm a devotee of paper still. <laughs> I, I understand. Every now and then to cheat when nobody's looking. And <laughs> out. 
take up a pencil and write on the edge of it. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. It's hard to get away from that for me okay. too. Well, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Anisha, did you want to, any closing remarks there? I really uh, like that chart uh, on, on the frequency spectrum showing where the TV channel were, the visible light and so forth. Uh, so it would be nice to have that, you know. As, yeah, definitely, as, definitely. <laughs> thank um, you very much for your, your talk. Thank you for joining me. This is actually, it's really, it's really fun to take a break from the physics research I do and like uh, just being in the lab and coming and be able to talk about folks with something a little different. So I really appreciate the time. Yeah. And all your guys' perspectives, they're very interesting. Yeah, we have great, great folks here that are very interested in a lot of different things. So thanks everybody for coming 